Gwilym, it's so good to have you back on the podcast. I've had an imposter for the last two, and it's felt it's felt quite strange not having you sat there. Oh, I've missed it actually. I was saying to you, um, yeah, I don't know how it happened, Mr. Couple. Didn't want to, never want to miss one, never want to miss one again. Yeah, don't don't say that because you're just going to let me down, aren't you? You're you're so oh, yeah. you one. I mean, I've I've never made that promise to you, and I just miss <laughs> them when I have to miss them. So uh, no, I, I think I think planned planned absences are they're a great thing, a totally great thing. But no, I'm uh, I, I love it. I want to be. I'm, I've got FOMO. I want to listen to everything I missed. It's it's it's. I've, just, uh, I've been so, empty. F- FOMO is that some kind of disease? Uh yeah, um, and there's a vaccine for it, but obviously we're worried about some of the vaccine waste. Um, so I, I wish we could just find a way of solving that problem, Lee. Um, sometimes you're just too clever, even for me, mate. <laughs> but what, but but what you've done there is you've immediately kind of halted the friendly banter at the start of the podcast to get it straight into the podcast. So um... Look, oh, hang on, I've got some. I wanted to talk more. Oh, okay, well carry on then. We, you, you, should, <laughs> you should have done your segue a little bit later, then, shouldn't you? I know. I just, I just got over excited by the connection. No, no. Did you have a, did you have a holiday? Did you have a nice holiday? Holiday? No, I've been, I've spent four days under a bath, in a bathroom suite for number four, son. <laughs> that's, as far as I can tell, that's, that's your kind of holiday, Lee. It's, it's absolutely my kind of holiday, and it was a proper old fashioned gut the bathroom and fit a new one from scratch. <laughs> absolutely loved it. I bet you do. We tiling? Do you do the tiling? I do the tiling as well. Yeah, had, had to get my tools out of cold storage and. Um, and kind of remember how to bend copper pipe and all those kinds of things that I used to do. One of the problems with keeping keeping tools in cold storage is, of course, spoilage, Lee, and that can be a real issue um, for you know, how are we going to basically protect them and sustain them longer. So yeah. it's interesting. So I, I, I always used to. So that. I always used to kind of rub a very small amount of um, silica-based oil over my tools, and that and that would prevent them from kind of going rusty. And yeah, I've, and I've been doing it for years. I, yeah, I've never really thought about whether I could, um, whether that was an invention or I could protect it or anything like that. But it's just something I've always done. That would be what a what a great idea that would be if, yeah, I, if yeah. only we could have a podcast about that. I, I've, I've gone and disclosed it now, though, haven't I? <laughs> Should we get? Well, my, no, oh, no. Talk quickly about my holiday. So I don't know. Because you've had a holiday, you've had a proper holiday, haven't you? Yeah, I forgot. Oh, excellent. So, I mean, I, I was looking at a whole bunch of different places to go to. Obviously, one of them was Kyrgyzstan, but it's never been, I did never quite knew how to get there. Um, but maybe we could talk about that on the podcast at some point. I don't know. But I actually went to Spain, had a lovely time on the beach, loved playing with, but Beth had a lovely time playing with the kind of the buckets and spades. And I was looking at that sand and thinking, what can you do with sand? What other good uses are there for it that you could possibly come up with? If you just I mean, you we... could do a podcast about that. we've used it for so many things haven't we over over yeah. the years i mean yeah. gl- glass comes yeah. from sand uh, but as a plumber yeah. of course i used to use it for casting lead um I used to use it to make a flat bed for casting lead or making molds of lion heads and all of those it's incredibly yeah. versatile stuff and that always used to leave a very thin layer of like silica um on the lead which would stop which would stop the lead from forming a natural patina and i always oh, found that really yeah. interesting almost as if there was some kind of protective characteristic there i i think there's something in this lee there is something in this, isn't there? This might be the best intro we've ever done, mate. <laughs> Lee Davis and Willem Roberts are the two IPs in a pod, and you are listening to a podcast on intellectual property, brought to you by the Chartered Institute of Patent Determined. Shall, shall we get our guests on now? Because this is just too exciting, isn't it? Go on, go on. So let's go with Acel first. Acel, would you introduce yourself, please, to, to me and Gwilym and the podcast world? Uh, hello, my name is Asel Sardbaeva. Um, I am a, a, an academic turned entrepreneur. Um, I um, originally was born in Kyrgyzstan um, uh, quite a long time ago, came to the UK about um, oh more than 20 years ago um, to do my PhD originally, but then um, uh, got married also during that time, um, stayed in the UK, um, got a job, um, got a family now. And then eventually was working as an academic for quite some years, over a decade, um, and uh, came up with a new idea for uh, storing vaccines using silica, as as was mentioned previously. Um, And uh, I now am commercializing this uh, method. It's a chemical method uh, and created a company uh, called Encilitec, um, where we are uh, bringing this technology now out of academia into the world, uh, into the market. Um, So this is a very short um, uh, uh, sort of introduction, but um, I can talk more about various uh, things on the way. (laughs) 
Oh, and, and you will. Don't worry about that. We will, um, we will. We'll ask you all sorts of interesting questions. But let's get Isabel on as well. Isabel, hello. Say hello. Say hello and introduce yourself, please. Hello, I'm Isabel Finney. I'm a partner with HLK, also known as Hazeltine Lake Kempner. I sit in the Life Sciences and Healthcare Group, which is part of our chemistry and life sciences team. And I work with a right, wide range of different kinds of clients in the life sciences and healthcare space, including some very exciting um, startups and spin outs, of which Arcillas and her company is one of them. And yeah, I've had the pleasure of working with them since about 2016 now. That's amazing. So, uh, and we're really looking forward to hearing the story. Gwilym, do you want to crack off with any questions? Because I feel this is almost your bag. Um, oh gosh, thank you. You never, you never do that. Um, I never do that, do I? I never do that. No, it's 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 a pleasure to to meet you, Asella, and to see you again, Isabel. Um, um, I think let's start off with the the science uh, on this one. It's quite exciting science. Uh, full disclosure, I'm a physicist, so. Uh, all I know is that the one where we didn't get into the intro was zero lights, and I'm sorry about that. We we, we actually <laughs> failed the challenge there. I will bring it in. Don't worry. <laughs> but I mean, you. I was look. We read up obviously on 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 the background, and it's quite an interesting kind of backstory to how the whole thing kicked off. It was, I gather it was with one of your kids getting an early vaccination that all started the whole story. Is that right? So um, I'm going to go back a little bit uh, even before um, to start the story. So um, I'm going to start by saying that um, my first degree uh, was in um, in a quite a mixed, um, it, it was quite a mixed degree. It was um, sort of a, a mixture of sciences and engineering. And then when I came to Cambridge, I did my PhD in mineral physics. So my um, PhD was actually studying uh, silica-based materials, and one of those materials was um, a, a material called zeolite. It's not a material which you usually hear about, but it's a very ubiquitous material. We have it everywhere, pretty much. We all, at the moment, have it on our skin because uh, it's usually present also in the washing powders. Um, it's used for removing calcium and magnesium from the hard water, and it aids washing process. Uh, Lee actually at the moment is sitting with uh, his curtains behind and uh, on the curtain there is a very beautiful pattern which reminded me of a zeolite because the structure is very similar. It's a very porous material, very open material. So it picks up um, ions and um, stuff into the molecules and that's how it's being used um, in the world. Um, so for many years, I've been studying these materials, um, and this was my interest, really. Um, but it's a crystalline material, so it grows in crystals. When I gave birth to my first daughter, so this was 2020, uh, 2010, I took her to be vaccinated, and I saw the doctor taking out the vaccine from the fridge and injecting into my daughter. I knew honestly very little about vaccines at the time. I mean, all I knew was that the vaccines prevent diseases. That's pretty much was my knowledge. And... Um, for me, it was fascinating to see that the vaccine was taken out of the fridge. So I naively said, can we just maybe warm it up a little bit? And the doctor said, no, you're crazy. It's going to spoil. So that's what's prompted me thinking about it. I started Googling. Uh, I found lots of horrific uh, statistics about how many vaccines are spoiling. Uh, so anything up to 50% sometimes of the vaccines are spoiling in the world today. I found the horrific statistics that uh, 1.5 million children worldwide, um, so these are infants under five, are dying from vaccine-preventable diseases every year. Just to put it in perspe into perspective, 1.5 million every year is uh, one every 20 seconds. So that's just horrified me, knowing that we have very good vaccines, effective and safe vaccines. So I started thinking about it. Um, I had I was in a very privileged position at the time. I had Royal Society Fellowship, which uh, allowed me to to grow my group myself, to bring my ideas. So while I was studying zeolites um, during daytime, I sort of started um, a, a side project, uh, you know, on a Friday afternoon for a couple of hours, where I I thought, can I use silica to to do something to to thermally stabilize vaccines. And because in the beginning I knew a lot about zeolites, those crystalline beautiful materials, I tried them. That didn't really work that, that well. So then I turned my um, attention to the amorphous silica. So amorphous silica is silica where there is no crystallinity, no long, long range order. So they're not as beautiful as that curtain which is behind Lee at the moment. <laughs> yeah, you should see my but, curtains. Yeah. <laughs> but 
but because they are amorphous, they can actually grow in a variety of different shapes. And that's what then uh, I thought, okay, if they do that, then uh, if my molecule, which I want to preserve, is it, if it has like wonky or weird shape, if it's an amino acid of some kind, if it's an antibody of some kind or, or a, a virus, a spherical virus or a spherical particle um, or viral particle, then maybe I can grow my silicon top in, in that shape, in the shape of that biomolecule. And that's what's then started me on the path of thinking about insilication. I mean, as you can see here, I, I mean, I knew very little about vaccines. So it's a very sort of medical area, immunological area. I came into it from the mineral physics uh, thinking and then obviously chemistry. The other co-inventor of the method, Stephen Wells, um, uh, another academic in the group, He uh, his degree, first degree was in uh, natural sciences uh, and he he was more doing physics. So our combined efforts sort of helped us to to come up with the concept. But then really the realization of the method started happening when we brought in uh, my student, um, Aswin Duki, who brought in the biology knowledge into this. So combined with all of those uh, uh, disciplines, then we were able to actually come up with the, with the working prototype, so to say, where actually method started working. And uh, from then on, obviously, we, we applied for patents um, and <laughs> things started moving a lot faster. Thank you. And Isabel, I'll come to the patent story in a minute, if at least you're happy for me to keep driving. No, you, you, you carry on, mate. I'm just fascinated by the whole story. I'm, I, I, it's amazing. I'm a big listener today. Cool, cool. Um, so, 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 so the original kind of in, insight was that the cold storage system approach required for vaccines basically led to huge amounts of wastage and complexity and everything else. But um, your your solution is more to do with, is it to do with the spoiled vaccines. Is that correct? Is that what you said? So um, so I didn't want the vaccines to spoil. So basically my thinking was um, I, want, um, I want our method to be used and applied right when the vaccines are made. So when the manufacturers produce them, the first thing they do is they do fill and finish and then they put stuff in the fridge. Uh, so that's with majority of the vaccines. And then with the newer mRNA vaccines, they put them in the freezer at minus 20 or minus 80. And then from then on, the transport and storage happens in the fridges or the freezers. And the big problem is that uh, if the fridge breaks or the freezer breaks, if there is no electricity on the way, if they arrive to the country where there is no uh, electricity, and for example, it sits on tarmac for two weeks during customs or something, that's when the breakages happen. And then the last mile, what's what's called the last mile for the vaccine delivery is where it's being taken to, to patients. So sometimes it could be a village somewhere remote where there's no even road to get there. So a person carrying the cool box with ice pack in it would be putting the vaccine into it and carrying it to the village. Mm. And the vaccine may not be arriving in the pristine form where it would be fully efficacious. The problem is with the majority of vaccines, we don't know whether they spoiled or not. So people might be sometimes injected with not very not very fully efficacious vaccines. I don't want to to scare people from from this. I don't want people to not get vaccinated. Because <laughs> We're very pro vax. We're pro vax. So I want to be very careful. Vax. Yeah, but um, most of the vaccines most of the vaccines are fine. It's just in some remote areas here yeah, there could be some problems where they might be spoiled. And so, oh, so so you're not. And are you removing the need for refrigeration altogether? Then possibly. So <laughs> yes. So so the mission for the company is to fully remove refrigeration. So we want to free vaccines from uh, fridge or freezer dependency. That's our mission statement. It's a very long term. Um, long-term thing, I think, because there are so many different vaccines. And obviously, we will not be able to do all vaccines immediately. We will be doing them one or two at a time, because this, this is just the nature of the research. We can't, we can't do all of them, which means that for some time, even once we have our insilicated thermally stable vaccines out there, there still be some other vaccines which will need refrigerators. So, so we fully understand that that's just the reality of it. But our mission is eventually to apply this to as many vaccines as possible so that we can free as many vaccines as possible from the fridge and do not require refrigeration or freezers at all. Uh, that's amazing. So one last sciencey question, and then Isabel, I'm going to yeah. find out about the patent story. Um, so this is me not knowing enough about any of the actual technology or science. You're basically giving people vaccines where they have a coating 
the silica, the amorphous silicon coating. How does that work? How, how does the vaccine get to the people if it's got something around it? <laughs> Simplistic question. If, it, if it's in a bag. <laughs> No, it, it, it's not really. But but uh, so basically, the the just just stepping back a little bit. So absolutely, we have a vaccine vaccine component, which could be a biomolecule of some kind um, or a virus or something. Uh, I'm going to call it a target. So our target is there. What we do is we apply silica on top, so it goes on the surface of that biomolecule, so it fully protects it and covers it. The reason why a lot of vaccines spoil when we take them out of the fridge is because um, inherently the physics of atom makes them vibrate and they unfold. It's this physical unfolding majority of the time which leads to the spoilages. It cannot fall back, unfortunately. So this is why they break and um, and cannot and don't work after that. So we are pr protecting in the first instance against that um, unfolding. We're also protecting them from aggregation. So aggregation is when they stick to each other. So if there is a layer on top, they can't stick to each other. So that's another thing. And then obviously we are protecting them also from bumping into each other and breaking. Also, that's another thing. Once we have once we have the layer, they are so protected that they can be taken anywhere uh, in a normal envelope or in a normal post. You know, no refrigerators, no freezers needed. But uh, when it comes to the patient, then the question is, how do we inject into people? Obviously, we want to be able to inject it into people. We've um, Because we are working with two different chemistries here, we have organic molecule inside, we have inorganic sand-like material silica on top. We can actually play on chemistry, so we can break the shell using inorganic chemistry methods without affecting the target. So that's what we've been doing so far, because we can break the shell, we can remove it, and we can then inject the uh, the vaccine itself. So that's one way of doing it. That's that's a possibility, but it's a little bit cumbersome. So what we want to do in the future is we we want to come up with a, a lot simpler method where we can actually reconstitute it quickly just before the injection, and then it would be injected into the patient. So that would be the the future step which we are just trying to solve at the moment. Thank you. That's really clear. And um, as I say. Apologies for any stupid questions, but it's, it's fascinating. Um, is, no, no, it's not stupid. It's, it's great questions. Great questions. <laughs> thank you. Well, it feels a bit like a disclosure meeting, which brings me neatly to, to Isabel. So, Isabel, how, how did you guys meet and has, has it has it gone so far? Well, thank you for bringing me in, but really our still story, it's so fascinating. And she's just conveying how um, the technology that she's developed is vitally important to the world and for saving lives. But to, to take it back a step, I was invited to go to the University of Bath back in 2016 to meet with her and her team. And obviously, I was super happy to go back because I'm actually also a graduate of Bath. So it's nice to go back um, and see the campus where, where I studied as well. Um, and from the moment that we met and we started talking, what you've just heard is um, us, it was quiet sort of motivation and determination to get this product out to the market. And we started chatting and we took time to to really hear about the, the silica chemistry, but also to hear about the, the vaccines that she wants to preserve inside. And moving on from there, we drafted, as, as many patent attorneys will be aware, drafted a first patent application, which was filed with the UK IPO. And following a fairly standard patenting process, we got information from the UK IPO in the first year to help us shape that first PCT filing. I, I, one thing that Asel mentioned there was the, the technology spread, organic or inorganic physics, biology, all kinds of stuff. Isabel, are you matching that with your team, Harry, or do you know it all? It's never a good idea to pretend to know it all, is it? <laughs> um, I can handle the, uh, the chemistry and the biotech side. Unfortunately, we've got lots of people within HLK that can help out with any additional understanding that's needed. Um, one thing that's been really special about working with Arsil and her team is the willingness and openness to work with us and fully answer all the questions. They really have taken time to answer what we've needed, uh, what we've needed to ask them and to provide all the information that we've asked for in a really timely fashion, which has been very special. And we've been able to get to really into the heart and the crux of the inventions with them that way. 
So uh, I'll just come in on this one also. Um, uh, what what was interesting in the beginning for for from my side was that um, when we had that first meeting with Isabel, I distinctly remember um, I fa found it super super hard that first meeting because um, that was it, what was really clear was that the language was uh, very different. Um, uh, I my English is my third language, so um, I find it sometimes quite hard uh, even to understand people um, just from the language point of view, from English point of view. But uh, when Isabel was asking questions sometimes, I, I distinctly remember I kept asking and asking to repeat and rephrase sometimes because it was very hard for me. The, the whole legal language was incredibly hard for me. So um, I came out from that meeting thinking, gosh, uh, how, how am I going to do this? Is, is that going to be really possible to do? And what we found quite quite good within our team was that uh, Stephen, uh, who is the other co-inventor of the method, was actually a lot better than me at um, understanding the, lang the language. And then uh, he was almost he almost became my translator. <laughs> we, would, we would speak, and he would sort of say to me, "Okay, this is this is what it means. Uh, whatever is written, okay, this is what we are reading." Um, and then I, I was able to understand a lot more. But I have to say that I knew so little about patenting to start with that for me it was um, like somebody dropped me into uh, a sea and me not being able to swim at all. So that's that's how it felt. And what was really great with um, HLK was that you really walked us uh, all the way and pretty much handhelding uh, from from the very beginning, which was super 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 useful. For, especially for me, Stephen. For Stephen, it was a lot easier, obviously. But for me, it was super, super challenging from the beginning. And then the journey which we took um, from 2016 uh, was incredibly, incredibly um, sort of humbling from one point of view for me, but also a very um, educational to learn how things are done and how things need to be done. Because I really understood the value of patenting. As we were walking from then on. Thank you. Uh, very quickly, what's your first two languages? Um, my first language is Kyrgyz, which is from a Turkish group of languages, and second language is Russian. Uh, it's very intimidating to all of us to have somebody podcasting in a third language. Thank you so much for that. It's incredible. Um, especially, especially when I struggle in my first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, well, don't, don't worry. I struggle with all three, actually, sometimes. <laughs> And you mentioned there about yeah the um yeah, the patenting I think it's quite coming yeah. into it it is so much and it's it's overwhelming and I can imagine Isabel and team did a beautiful job of uh, making it relevant to you but obviously it's got to fit in with what your business is trying to achieve and so have you found that having the patent pending and all that kind of thing has that been something that's been beneficial to to business? It was hugely beneficial. So when we started um, fundraising, so this was twenty twenty. When we, um, from pretty much first conversations with investors, it became very clear that having patents was hugely valuable. And then obviously our business model within the company is based on that knowledge, on that intellectual property, which we've built, which means um, that's the uh, most expensive, well, the most valuable asset of the company now. So, um, I mean, before that, I knew it's, it was good to have patents, but since we started uh, commercializing, it became absolutely clear that it's crucial for the company. So, I tell presumably a lot of this is all about you know, getting the right investment in. Uh, yes, absolutely. We were uh, absolutely fortunate uh, of having um, brilliant investors who uh, backed us in the beginning. So, we had um, Science Angel Syndicate and um, VC a fund uh, called Quantex. Um, so they were both uh, originally from Bristol and Southwest um, area. Uh, both uh, really got on with our message, um, uh, our um, mission of bringing uh, and democratize, bringing vaccines to everyone and democratizing access to vaccines. So I wanted also to shout out a, a big thank you to our uh, investors who backed us up in the beginning. And obviously, um, we are fundraising today, so um, we are uh, looking for more investors right now. So um, if, if you know of any investors who want to join um, in, uh, join um, our journey with Insultech, please um, get in touch with me. And, and Isabel, presumably, it's, it's fun for you to know where you fit in. So sometimes, as partner terms, we don't always know what the business is behind it actually is about, but presumably you're closely involved in that and you know exactly what you need to do to, to help the business. 
that's one of the things of working um, with Arcel and her group um, with a smaller company is that it's, there's a very direct link between what they're inventing, what their company needs to do, and then what I need to do um, back in the office with my team. There's certainly the need for everything to link up quite sensibly. And at the moment, we're having some discussions about territorial coverage. And there are clearly links there between uh, the advice that we can give them, the cost estimates that we're obviously providing to them, and Encilitec's thought processes around where they're likely to manufacture and export their products to, who they might work with in the future. Um, all those sorts of questions have to play into uh, a conversation. So it's a really interesting discussion every time we meet with them. And presumably gives you flexibility to decide where the business eventually goes, because there's all kinds of different places you might end up, I guess. I sell, you know, you might run it all yourself you might be licensing out you might perhaps be acquired I guess all those I don't know what, what do you have a plan yet are you allowed to share a plan or <laughs> we um well as as, a, as any small startup we are trying to be as agile and as flexible as possible obviously yes we we have thought of all of those possible different scenarios and uh, there are some scenarios which are more preferable than others <laughs> obviously but um it's it's a little bit early i guess to say um specifically whether we're going to be acquired or whether we're going to be producing stuff or where we will be producing even at the moment we're trying to guess and make as as best guess as possible where this is going to be what's interesting at the moment in the vaccine production area is that um for for decades there was a predominance of um there, there was um, uh, 10 biggest companies who usually produced most of the vaccines. But actually, in the last um, decade, or maybe uh, more than a bit of a decade, um, that situation has changed a lot. There are a lot more regional producers, like, um, for example, Serum Institute of India for um, India and Asia. There is a lot of production in China. There is a lot of production in Indonesia, in Brazil. Um, in South Africa now starting also. So um, there's a lot more sort of decentralization into different regions of the world because we want to make production as close as possible to where the vaccines will be then consumed. And uh, that's actually really changing the whole picture at the moment. Uh, and for us, it's quite exciting to be working with a lot more companies than just um, Big Five as it's used to be for, for many decades before. That's interesting. And Isabel presumably poses some fun challenges for where you patent. It certainly does. It makes us want to think about um, patenting requirements all around the world, but also how we can, for as long as possible, keep the company's options open in um, where they eventually secure patent protection. And sounds like it's the patenting is not stopping. I mean, I certainly mentioned all kinds of future or kind of current research obviously let's not give anything away <laughs> i'm not no, allowed to do that no, we're not allowed to give anything away at this stage <laughs> no, 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 no. but i guess there's a there's a lot of ongoing patenting as you solve uh, your shell breaking i wrote down here your shell breaking problems and, and and these other things as well so uh you've got a kind of a rolling pipeline as it were of ip protection uh, absolutely. So uh, as I, as I have already said, the, yes, the IP is super important for our, for our company. So obviously, expanding that IP is um, is something which we've been working on a lot, and we we do a lot of R and D still, which means that there's a lot of things which are being uh, happening right now and uh, will be patented more in the future. Yeah. Isabel told me absolutely not to say anything about new stuff, so I will not. <laughs> Nope. that's great you've been listening to us that's great well we did have one podcast recently where we, i think lee and i came up with some <laughs> variations that we decided to edit out yeah <laughs> we're, 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 we're inventing on the hoof weren't we <laughs> <laughs> um, i've got so my my last question before i hand back to lee is uh sounds to me like short term we're talking about you know in initial vaccine delivery and reducing spoilage, cutting out the cold chain. Long term, I think this spends the it spells the end of the refrigerator altogether. Am I right? For everything. Not not for everything, because at oh. the moment at the moment refrigerators are being used not just for the vaccines, but also for some chemicals, ingredients, uh, foods. That's a big uh, big area where uh, refrigerators are being used. So all of those areas are obviously going to stay. So, uh, for example, the the, the very famous Coca Cola um, supply chain, which has enormous refrigeration uh, all over the world, is 
probably still going to stay, I'm, I'm guessing. Oh, what we are trying... Such- what we are trying to say is that we're trying to say for the vaccine specifically, we want to remove that. So we want people to be able to get vaccines in the places of the world where they can't get them today. So this is what uh, our mission statement is. And that's sorry. I, I remember that. So I should stop being frivolous. Um, the Earth shot comes in here, of course. This is yes. where the connection is with with all of us anyway, because we're very big supporters of Earthshot. Obviously, you've 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 gone into them with this kind of proposition because of the global benefits, the health benefits, and everything else that it brings. Has has that experience been? It's been incredible experience, actually. Uh, we were thrilled to be um, to be nominated. Obviously, uh, very happy. We went into a uh, waste-free world um, category, and um, that's that's where we were trying to articulate how much vaccine wastage is happening today. Because it's it's not just the vaccines be, being wasted, but it's also all of the uh, vaccines are put into something, into plastic or uh, glass vials. So all of those are being wasted. Then the energy is being wasted because we are transporting them in freezers or fridges. The freezers uh, need some freon in it, which means we have to use a lot more different gases to do that. So all of that is being wasted on the way. So um, we think that without technology, we will be able to get rid of all of that waste. And that's where our uh, preposition is for the uh, for the Earthshot Prize. I was um, I was having a little read of the Earthshot nomination in my prep for this, and it struck me, and take this in the way it's intended, it was almost too clever clever for Earthshot. It was um, it, it was almost like we were trying jointly to to make this revolutionary process invention fit the Earthshot criteria. When it's sort of like much bigger than that, is that fair? Mm. I have to say I am I'm slightly in awe of of short of short price. I think the reach of it is so big that um it it can make a big difference to um well first of all the companies who take part in it. For them, obviously, it's a big difference, but also the companies then can also make a big difference having the Earthshot Prize. So it's it sort of benefits both, and then on top of it, it then on t- it doubly benefits the planet. So I think from that point of view, um, I mean, we are trying to bring here a, quite a revolutionary technology, which can really disrupt the whole status quo of the vaccine uh, transport and potentially can affect quite a lot of people around the world. So I think the, the Earthshot Prize is, it also has that capacity. So it can really help us to do that. So I think from that point of view, I don't think we're really trying to fit it in specifically, but I think the complementarity is there. Yeah, okay, cool. What I mean. cool. A question for Isabel, if I can, because so I've I've been sat here feeling quite humbled. Doesn't ha- doesn't happen to me often on a podcast, <laughs> as, as Willem will um, attest. Feeling feeling quite humbled uh, and really quite insignificant. You know, I I, I couldn't have been uh, pretty much probably no one else in the world could have been sat in that position that you were with your daughter being vaccinated and then making that leap between that process. And all of the issues that we've grown to understand exist. I mean, we learned a huge amount through the pandemic, didn't we, all about vaccines. Those of us who knew knew nothing suddenly, suddenly became aware of the refrigeration issue uh, in in terms of kind of storage and mass transportation. So it all all became a really live issue for us. And there you were already grappling with it because you were able to connect that single occasion where you're in that kind of position with, um, with your expertise. Was it a well moment for you, Isabel? Was this one of those moments when someone comes along and it's like, oh, well? That's exactly it. That's exactly how I felt when I first met with Arcel and and Stephen. This is an innovation which not only helps to create a waste-free world, which is the category that Incinitec is put forward for within the Earthshot Prize, but the potential to save lives. I think Arcel mentioned it earlier. 1.5 million infants a year die. Uh, and 5 million people a year die from completely vaccine-preventable diseases. And here she is. She's developed something that could revolutionise healthcare on the planet, not only for humans, but there's, there are animal diseases as well. And this can be applied to vaccines for farm animals. And you think of the number of people who rely on their animals for their livelihood as well across the planet. So the implications are enormous. 
So you use the word humbling. That's a great word, but also a privilege to get to work with this kind of technology and these sorts of people who are that motivated to get this uh, technology and innovation out into the wider world. And I said, what, what do you need to do that? What, what's next on the journey? How, how, I mean, Grillam, Grillam touched on sort of like licensing and all of those kinds of things. Here, here you are. I imagine there's not a huge amount of competition in the field. I imagine that you're a leader in all of this. It sounds like you've got a very small team and kind of you need you need to scale up in some way, shape or form. How does all of that happen? So, um, yeah, several questions here, actually. Um, yeah, sorry. Which, uh, no, no, that's good. That's good. I, I'm a bit of a Gatlin gun when it comes to questions. Apologies. <laughs> So um, w- what's next is, uh, okay, so um, for the company specifically, what's next is uh, right now we are a fundraising. So I'm fundraising as a CEO of the company. So what it means is that we still have runway at the moment, but um, that runway is going to run out at some point. So uh, I need to raise money to make sure that um, our company continues. So that's a big step for me. We're applying also for some grants because we want to de-risk some specific areas where we are looking to develop uh, the method more uh, for specific um, products. Um, so that's another area. Um, we are hiring people into the company. So that's that's another yeah. thing. We are we're constantly growing our company. So it's a very specialized method, obviously, which means when we hire people uh, to work with us, um, they... Well, most of the time they come with not knowing how to do this. So we have to t- teach, uh, teach and uh, upskill people, and then eventually uh, they can start or they can work in in our company. So we're constantly looking out for people. We are um, expanding our IP, so that's a big uh, area which we're working on at the moment. And another big area for me also is we are looking for perfect partners for us. So we are currently uh, working already with one partner company. So it's a top 10 um, EU animal vaccine producing company. So they um, send us some of their vaccines uh, and we are insulicating those vaccines. We will do testing together and potentially in the future, we want to go to regulatory bodies for approvals on those vaccines. But um, we're working only with one company right now. We, we're working with another two partners, uh, partner organizations, but we want to work with as many uh, vaccine um, producers, developers, manufacturers as possible, because we want the method to be obviously used uh, everywhere. So right now we are speaking to several um, human vaccine um, manufacturers and developers where we're trying to come up with the right um, business um, project for uh, the right vaccine, because it has to be uh, the right vaccine for us from the technology point of view, but also it has to be the right vaccine from the business point of view that it will be selling in the future for the companies to be interested in. So yeah, that's that's sort of the areas where majority of my interest as focus is at the moment. Hey, you, you answered a complicated rambling question brilliantly, I think. <laughs> it is one of the it's, it's also a bit of a paradox, isn't it? You're you, you're the scientific brain, and you're on sales now. It must be stressful for you. Uh, I uh, so I'm not on sales. So we've we've actually got a commercial director now in the company who is oh, doing good. the partnering side. So I'm not really involved there. So I'm really brought in at further conversations where it's it gets more um, sort of either sciencey or more more sort of legal and all, all of those things we've also got um we've also got uh, i didn't mention in the beginning and I sh- and sorry i will do it now uh when we started the company there were four co-founders of the company so me and steven were two co-founders and we were inventors of the method but also we had two other co-founders um uh Aswin Duki and matt slade they were my former phd students so they did their phd at the university of bath uh on insilication of uh, toxoids and viruses, um, and um, they came into the company um, uh, because they brought very different backgrounds again. So Aswin brought the biology background. He actually, before doing his PhD, he already worked in a couple of uh, vaccine developing companies. So that that was also a very, um, very important experience for us as a company. But Matt also has done the IQR marketing validation program with Insilitech, which helped us then because we talked to 100 stakeholders uh, from the area. So that helped us then to, sh- um, to create the business model for the company. 
So all four of us um, are a very tightly knit team. We work really well together. And uh, uh, currently the roles are divided between us that uh, I'm a CEO. So I set out the vision for the company. Um, Aswin is CTO, so he works in the lab um, and does the development. Um, Matt um, is looking after operational side and Stephen is looking after IP and regu regulatory side sort of um, within the company. So uh, we're, we're coming near the end of, of the podcast, um, but one more, one more question from me before we wrap up, if that's okay. You said that English is your third language, um, but are you developing the language as you go on? Because I searched end silication and every use of that word seems to come back to you, Asal. Is that is, is is it a word of your invention? It's my word, yes. I, I made it up, yeah. Uh, I just like the word. I was playing I, I was playing on the word silica to start with, because obviously silica is the material we're using. And uh, I remember distinctly one day, um, so this was just, this was actually some years before we started the company. I was talking about the method. I, I wanted to coin the term. And I was talking to my um, uncle in Kyrgyzstan actually about it. And he said, in silica, in silica, it sounds like a sale slightly, isn't it? And I never, never figured that it was, but he was like, yeah, it sounds very similar, like your name. Um, but uh, yeah, I just really liked the sound of that. So I, I, I made it up and um, I, I got a lot of criticism on that point, actually, because as scientists, it's, we're very careful creating new words because they need to be described somehow. So eventually, yeah, I, I took a lot of, a lot of sort of beating on it. <laughs> it's a lovely word. It sums it up and it rolls off the tongue, I think. It's, um, yeah. It's a little better than zeolitify. <laughs> well, uh, we are not, we are not uh, using zeolites. So zeolites are crystalline materials. We're using amorphous silica instead. Cur curtains, not curtains. Come on, you must remember Sorry. that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but you know that one of the reasons why I also wanted to create this word is because in the beginning, we were describing our method as encapsulation method. And there are a lot of encapsulation methods out there. So um, people have been using encapsulating in plastic, encapsulating in PLA or PLGA or other materials, you know. So encapsulation as a chemical method is out there and has been for a long time. I really wanted to distinguish us because we are not creating a shape and then stuffing the biological inside because that's what essentially encapsulation is. You create something, you encapsulate by putting it inside. In our case, we are not doing that. We are actually growing our shell on top of the biological by mimicking the surface and the structure of, well, the, the, the outer surface of the, of the biological. And yeah. I really wanted to make that distinction. So that's why I wanted to create a word to make that distinction. And that's, ooh, ooh, that's why I started. Ooh, I've, got, I've got a question for Isabel now. So, is, so Isabel, as a patent attorney, if someone comes along with a word that doesn't exist, what sort of challenge does that present for you? Well, frequently a word has been developed to describe a new product or a new process. And that's great because then I want to learn about their new product or their new process. And of course, if a client has a made up word for their product or method and are likely to use that word in any sort of commercial context, then I would also introduce my colleagues in our trademarks and brandings team too for some early advice on that. And, and presumably you're not going to find you're not going to find it in the prior art, are you? No, and that's the idea. Uh, there has been a huge amount of prior art for us to to work through as we have gone through the patenting journey. And a lot of it, as Arsul have just said, is um, quite a different approach of stuffing a biological molecule into something else that's already been prepared. Whereas uh, we have been able to clearly show this distinction in, in their method and how it has all sorts of advantageous properties. Also, in the beginning, uh, Lee, you, you alluded to the fact that silica is such a ubiquitous, ubiquitous material. Silica is what sand is made of. Um, I mean, it's the same formula chemically, but it's also a material which has been used over the years in many different industries, in silic silicon oil, silica additives to the paints. Um, uh, I mean, silica is being added to tablets as an additive. In my old world as a plumber, when silicon, seal when silicon sealant came out, it was a game changer. Exactly. Yeah. So sil silica is such a ubiquitous material that obviously for um, for the um, examiners on our patents, um, I, I sort of imagined in my head that they typed in silica 
biological or uh, biomolecule. And then obviously, if you do that, there's going to be loads of prior art from all decades of research which was done in 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 many different areas so we had to deal with lots of lots of things which came out from previous years yeah that certainly was a lot of prior art but we've uh, um, been able to demonstrate uh, clear differences as we've walked through this challenge and ourselves helped and uh, Stephen that you mentioned before he was very very helpful in defining the differences for us I, I could keep going forever with this, but I'm conscious that we're time limited and we're, we're we're slightly over time. We've got a few minutes left, so let's um let's let's kind of finish off in the way that we would normally do. So we always have sort of like a bit of a tangential question at the end, Asal and Isabel. Uh, you're new to the podcast; you may have listened before, so you know that me and Grillam at the end, or usually me, will come up with a half baked question that's been inspired by something that's been said throughout the podcast. Grillam gets the chance to answer it first, then you two do, and then he always surprises me by coming back to me, and obviously I don't see it coming. <laughs> um, it's 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 well it's a well worked formula that's all you got. Um, so Grillam, I was thinking. So when Asael was describing the process early on, it struck me that the the bigger challenge was the unwrapping as much as the wrapping. That was what I got. For. What's the hardest thing you've ever unwrapped? <laughs> oh, uh, uh, it's definitely when you buy anything um, airside from the tech shop at an airport, it comes in that. I'm not going to swear that blooming, that wrapping. That the only way to open it is with a pair of scissors, which you can't get airside at an airport. So you buy yourself a lovely pair of headphones for the aeroplane, and then you can't open the blooming thing unless you've got really sharp teeth. <laughs> it, Isabel, you shouldn't have laughed because I'm coming to you next. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, kind of related to what Willem just said, I always think that the worst packaging to open is when you've just bought a new pair of scissors. <laughs> because the reason you're buying a new pair of scissors is you need a new pair of scissors, but you need a pair of scissors to get in. <laughs> and and also they, they they've started cable tying them to the package as well, have they? So they're, oh, yeah, yeah. They're, they're not just packed in an impenetrable form, but even when you're going to open, you've then got to try and find something to cut the little cable tie that's holding yeah. the handles together. Yeah. I saw, I mean, cl- clearly you should answer this by saying um, the kind that of seems- silica <laughs> like wrap that you're putting around all kinds of biological materials, but you're not allowed to, okay? So what's, <laughs> what's the toughest thing you've had to unwrap? I'm going to be a little bit controversial here, actually, and what I'm going to say is <laughs> I get actually quite annoyed when, um, I mean, we, we do lots of, obviously, deliveries these days, um, all of us, and actually I do get annoyed when they don't wrap stuff properly, you know, because um, I I find that if I've ordered something, it has to be protected. It has to be fully protected. And if something is broken, I get really annoyed if something is broken because I don't want to be sending it back, you know, dealing with all of that. Mm. It's just going to take up so much so much time. So I get annoyed when it's not wrapped properly, actually, bizarrely enough. So um, I've just I've just had a delivery um, yesterday, which arrived from um, some one of the places I ordered from. And when it arrived, um, the, the outer packaging was a little bit broken. And when I picked it up, I sort of, shook it a little bit and it was something was rattling and I thought oh god no I don't want it to be broken and I was really annoyed until I actually unwrapped it and then I realized actually it was a wrap inside it was wrapped okay so I had to actually I had to find scissors open it and all of those things but I was convinced that it was not wrapped properly and I would have been so mad if it was broken actually it wasn't it was fine but I would have been mad so I, um, I I know you're coming to me, mate. It's okay. I, know I was actually b- before I come to you, can I just commend you, Lee, on a really good yet yeah, silly question. Uh, well played. Oh, thank um, you. I, I've heard a few. I like that one. I, Over I to do, you. I do, I do take my job quite seriously. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, a bit like um, you, Grillam and Isabel, I, I do find the hermetically sealing goods that can't otherwise perish infuriating. To the degree, so I'm I'm quite a regular goer to B and Q because I, st- I still do a little bit of plumbing for friends and family on the side, and kind of I'm always doing DIY at home. So I'm a regular goer to B. I always take a standing knife with me, and I always leave the packaging that they've put. You know, so you you go and buy a spanner or something, and it'll be in this massive kind of plastic box thing um, that you can't get into. So I always I always take a standing knife, cut it up, and leave the box on the side just to try and make a point to B and Q that that could have just been hanging on a shelf. Yeah, nothing's going to happen to it, but. As I was fitting my lad's bathroom over the weekend, I, I was reminded and not thinking that it was going to come up now. It's sanitary wear. So when you get a bath and you fit a bath, 
the baths are some form of acrylic and they've all you can never actually see that they've got a protective film over them yeah i i know it's there i take it off it's so difficult to get off so difficult to find get a start somewhere and and, and get it off but but i know it's there so i always take it off no matter how difficult that is but the times back in my old working life as a plumber when i would go to someone's house and that they would say oh my bath it's got all bubbly and crackly no it hasn't you've left the film on um so so obviously some people find it so difficult they just leave it on hmm. i said i don't suppose you've got any more examples do you yeah. uh well i i was just thinking actually of something recently so um it's quite a big concept, obviously, to to talk about biomolecules, silica, and all of those things. So we've we are always trying to come up with with ways of making it easier uh, to explain and to actually to show because it's it's biomolecules. I'm always talking about silica, uh, tetrahedra, blah 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 like molecules. So I wanted to see how I can find a simplified, more simplified method. So I was actually talking to my mom recently, and um, it was her birthday. So she was given for her birthday a box of strawberries dipped in chocolate. And immediately when I saw that, I thought, oh, my God, this is such a really beautiful way for us to actually describe insilication. Because your strawberry, the strawberries were all different shapes. So there were some really knobbly, some quite beautiful, um, sort of almost spherical, and some were quite knobbly, big ones. You know know how sometimes you get those strawberries which are... Like really roots, root roots. Yeah. yeah, 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 exactly. But what was beautiful was that uh, what they did is they they sort of very, uh, very beautifully uh, put them in chocolate, and then what you see on the outer surface, you can see this layer of chocolate, and it really followed the shape of those um, strawberries. So if they were all nobly, they were nobles, you could see them perfect. I thought this is beautiful. This is how we need to do outreach. This is how we need to do it. So I thought I immediately imagined me standing with uh, with a table full of uh, strawberries and different fruits. So, for, so it could be a banana, for example, or it could be a, a completely weird shape, you know. And then people just coming and trying to dip them in the chocolate. And then you, what you do is when you do dip it in chocolate, I, I, I can see myself even explaining, look, your fruit is a biomolecule, your <laughs> chocolate is silicon. You dip it in, you bring it out, it it all solidifies immediately. And by the way, insilication is a very fast method. So so that would be really analogous, actually. Perfect. And then you have your fruit, which is completely covered in chocolate and protected by that chocolate, actually. And it's all bespoke and um, tailor-fitted, basically. So I'm going to leave you here with the (laughs) image of fruit covered in chocolate. (laughs) Uh, I'm loving the idea of peeling a banana so you can apply a protective outer coating to it. <laughs> oh, thank you, SL. Thank you, Isabel, for coming on. It's been uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. This podcast it's going to be up there in my top five thank you. for sure. I've re- re- really enjoyed it. Not not just the technology and the story, but the way you've put it across. Yeah, lo- loved every moment of it. Hope you've enjoyed it too. Um, yeah, thank you. We're, we're, thank we're letting you know when it, we're, we're letting you know when it comes out. Um, Gwilym, I will see you on the next one. But before we leave. Just that little friend, little friendly reminder that if you've enjoyed this podcast, leave us a little review on the platform of your choice because that will enable other people to find it. Um, and I'm sure that um, there are lots of people in the world that I sell inhabits that would love to listen to this podcast uh, and make sure we get. And for every positive review, Lee will send you a chocolate-coated banana. Thank you.